today. We are here for the art of quiet quitting, work-life balance in a diverse workplace. Embrace is an employee resource group in partnership with Fitch Group, and we aim to create a more diverse and inclusive company which embraces and highlights all cultures. We support career advancement in the workplace from hiring all the way from leadership ranks for colleagues for, of all ethnic backgrounds. Embrace represents Black, Asian and minority staff across all global regions within Fitch Group and beyond. And I will hand off to Ruth. Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Ruth Ekong. Um, I'm the former chair of Embrace and I'm currently a director at Fitch Solutions. I'd like to take this moment to introduce the panel. Um, they are some wonderful ladies that are here working at Fitch with myself and they will be sharing also this afternoon. So we've got Emmanuel Masudi, Jessica Bunting, and Victoire Jaran that are joining me to discuss the art of quiet quitting, work-life balance in a diverse workplace. Please could you take a moment just to introduce yourselves. Hi everyone, my name is Emmanuel. Um, I work at Fitch Learning in the CQF program. Um, I'm part, I am a program executive. Hi everyone, I'm Jessica Bunting. Uh, I work in the operational risk group of the structured finance team of um, Fitch Ratings. Hello, my name is Victoire Janan and I work within Fitch Solutions, which is the commercial part of Fitch Ratings or Fitch Group. Uh, I'm director for account management, uh, taking care of strategic accounts across Germany, Austria and Switzerland. Thank you all. So the question on everyone's mind today, we've had a lot of feedback on the title of this session. I'm sure everybody's wondering what this conversation is going to be about. We're super excited to hear from yourselves and you know what your experiences have been as well as our, as well as our panelists as well. Um, I think what is really important is to understand, could we just get the next slide, is again, this is quite a, a hot topic in terms of quiet quitting, in terms of you know, the, the influx currently of people leaving the work, uh, workforce. Um, this is a really important time to discuss the culture uh, of the work life post COVID. So um, let's understand the definition of quiet quitting. So, you can see here on our slide, we've got quiet quitting means completing one's minimum work requirements without going above and beyond or bringing work home after hours. Loud quitting, the alternative is instead involves talking loudly and openly about looking for elsewhere for work, using the prospect of leaving as a negotiation tactic. So this actually doesn't uh, equate to leaving one job you know, effectively, but there is elements of a change in how you do your work and how you show up in the workforce. Um, we'd like to give a quick disclaimer that this conversation is not a guide on how to leave your job quietly or loudly, but rather how to navigate and succeed in a workplace from the perspective of black and brown or diverse employees. So can we get the first poll up please? And we'd like to ask you the question, have you ever quietly quit. So looking at the definition on the screen, does that apply to you? Um, you know, what, what has your experience been? Oh, we've got quite a few responses already. Um, lots of yeses already, some no's. So we're just going to give it a moment for you to, to give us some responses and feedback. So whilst I wait for that, I just want to kind of open the floor to the panelists. So, um, you know, looking at looking at our, our, our team of panelists now, um, Victoire, can I can I open the floor and ask you, um, has quietly quitting ever been an option for you? Have you, um, in your role, have you um, had any experiences that have meant that you have felt the need to do so? Um, thank you, Ruth. <laughs> um, yes, I have to admit that I've, um, yeah, I've already quite created my job. Uh, obviously, not 
at Fitch Solutions, but uh, at the previous uh, company. But I think quiet quitting, to be honest, is not the right way of doing things in my sense because, um, you know, it, it's really important to kind of, you know, to kind of um, talk about what's not working well, to talk about things that don't, doesn't, or that don't, uh, you know, function the way you would like them to function. And it's also important to tell people about, you know, to get your voice heard. And there are different ways of doing so. So quite quitting is, um, yeah, we should be care careful if we, if we think of quiet quitting. But I have been quiet quitted after six and a half years because, um, you know, I've, I've tried to kind of let people hear my voice, but <laughs> it seemed not to be, you know, not, not, not to, to, to have brought any changes. So, um, yeah, the, you know, the final, the final way of getting out of it was to quite quit. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and I can imagine that, that there are reasons or conditions why that even becomes an option in the first place. So um, we can understand, and I can see some comments in the, in the chat that are agreeing with you that, you know, there's a reason behind it, but maybe not always the best approach. So I, I'm just gonna take a moment to share the poll result, results, uh, just to get an idea of what our audience think of this as well. So we've got um, 15 who have said yes, they have quietly quit. Um, and we've got 13 who've said, no, they haven't quietly quit. So we've got almost sort of just over 50% of people who um, have actually done that. So interestingly enough, you know, you're not alone in, in that consideration. Um, I just want to quickly uh, uh, go over to Jessica and say, um, you know, have you had a similar experience um, in, in your world? If you give us a bit of background, has that ever been an option for you to quietly quit? Um, in my career, no, I think the kind of organizations I've worked at, um, it's not been an option from, for me partially because, um, I've worked in organizations where there's limited number of people that look like me, uh, and I felt like I needed to represent, even if, um, the conditions which would have been fair weren't met. Uh, so I have pushed forward and, and carried on doing above and beyond to demonstrate that we deserve a place at the table, uh, we deserve the promotions, we deserve uh, the, the pay rises just like everyone else. And um, because I've often been the only one of my grade in an organization that has been a black woman, it hasn't necessarily been something that I wanted to do because I felt like it may close the door for others behind me. Thank you. No, again, I think as uh, people of colour, we tend to feel we have a responsibility um, to, you know, not uh, give up or, or stand down. So I, I completely get the, the, the feeling of responsibility in that regard. Um, thank you. I, I just wanted to pose a question also to the audience. For those who said yes, um, why was quite putting an option for you? And you can just drop your responses in the chat. Um, I think you know there's been a lot of, of discussion around the topic of quiet quitting and actually what um, you know what that means for opportunities for people coming behind us um, for those who also are having a similar experience to us you know what is it that then makes us consider this to be an option I think uh, I'd like to say from my perspective and maybe from others as well can relate. Um, the pandemic and lockdown gave a lot of people time to consider, um, you know, what they wanted to do with their lives, the kind of um, uh, experience they wanted to have. A lot of people really took the time, you know, two years is not a short period of time to really consider, OK, what is it that I'm looking for? And I think that then sparks this, um, you know, big movement for people to want to decide to leave their roles or maybe do less in the workplace. So again, that is quite a key, um, I think, trigger point for most people to really uh, maybe not want to do too much. Or, you know, some people may have experienced burnout. Um, I think there are quite common grounds for people to feel like, you know, actually, I'd rather not, um, you know, kill myself at the expense of um, just being at work. So um, that's quite a key one. Um, the next question would be, do you feel that, 
doing your job should should be enough you know in terms of how we then show up a lot of us have you know been overworked experienced burnout um do any of you feel that you know when you're in the office just coming to work doing what you're doing is that not enough to to progress it in this space and i'll i'll direct that emmanuel what do you think um the approach should be with that um i do believe that doing your job should be enough i think it's important also to understand that there's some sectors where you don't really have um you know you don't have the chance to just keep your work at work you would have to go home and keep um working and different sectors have to uh you know don't have that shall i say luxury to just stop at at, at work but really and truly doing your job should be enough um, you shouldn't have to bend backwards you shouldn't have to get to a point of burnout because then it becomes counterproductive and actually you're not really helping the company move forward so I think it's about creating a good life balance um, doing what you need to do in order to get a good outcome but not to the detriment of your well-being or not to the detriment of your mental health Thank you. That's such a key, key point you mentioned there. And I just want to segue into another question. How relevant do you think, with that in mind about burnout, um, how relevant do you think that is to the underrepresented community? So, you know, our black and brown diverse staff, do you think that that's more um, enhanced or, or more, you know, felt more widely? Or do you think it's sort of like everyone else? Do you, do you think that adds a, a level of um, increase in what you feel? Yes. Um, because uh, as an underrepresented person, you do feel that you're not seen as much, and sometimes you you feel marginalised. So sometimes it it means that you have to work harder. You feel as if you have to work harder to be seen or to be um, compensated. Can I say um, about your work? So yeah, it it feels like it it it's different. It feels like you have to work extremely hard for people to recognise how great you are. Thank you. And Jessica, Victoire, do you kind of agree with that? Um, yeah, it feels like you knew it, Ruth. Um, I, I agree with that to some extent, uh, to the extent that it's not worth working yourself, you know, up to... Uh, up to burnout and so on. That, that's absolutely not uh, contraproductive, as you said, Emmanuel. But I think it's a fact that as an underrepresented um, you know, um, employee, you definitely have to work harder to prove that you can do the job. That's you know, because you, we are in an environment where um, unfortunately people don't believe that we are able to do quite a lot of things and I mean I mean you, you are we you know we have to realize that me myself I come from Cameroon so I had to learn German moving to Germany to study you know um, so that's not my mother language so I had to learn that language I had to, to learn you know how the business goes how the culture is how you know how the working culture you know, in companies in Germany are, um, uh, are and, and, and definitely you have to do more efforts, you know, to get to, or to have your job done than just doing what you have to do, right? In terms of language barriers, in terms of cultural barriers, so at the end of the day, you have to do more. Um, so we shouldn't underestimate that effort you have to do to be able to show that you can do the work, that you understand the language, that you understand the working culture, that you are able to, you know, to, to you know, to, to um, you know, to support your clients or, or whatsoever. So, I think it's 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 being expected from uh, from people from you know from different um, cultures to you know to, to to just do more than what it it will be you know the average for anyone else who has been who was raised in Germany or in Europe or what you know that's 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 my view on that. Totally agree with Twana. I'll definitely share my own a bit. But Jessica, I, I just want to ask you the same question. You know, do you feel that it's a correct uh, assumption that there is a bigger pressure on black and brown employees, 
you know, employees to, to do that, to, to push themselves to that limit um, where they then want to then quite quick as a result of the pressure. Yeah, I think there definitely is an increased uh, pressure. I don't think it's right that there is, but it, it is the case that that occurs in very many industries, not just the financial um, industry. I think there's a, a level that you, you can go above and beyond and do your job really well. You can try to understand the, the business and make sure a lot of people, if they see themselves in somebody, then they can relate. And if they don't see themselves in, in you, they can't relate. And then therefore you don't necessarily get pushed forward in your career. So you feel like you have to compensate with being the best so that you can then be noted. But there's a there's a there's a line that you can do your best and you can do as much as you can to push your brand and make sure people understand who you are and what you can do but you don't want to lose yourself you still want to be yourself you don't want to need to code switch to to fit into an organization so there's a there's a line in which you um you know you're I'm personally happy to work hard work extra hard but I will be me and my culture is mine and I won't lessen it. So it, it's kind of the way in which I have approached my, my work life uh, and it's, it's the way I intend to continue. <laughs> no, thank you so much. And I really want to understand more about your journey and into senior leadership as well. Um, I, I just wanted to add, and similar to what Victoria said, so I... Um, have a legal background myself and in terms of the, the requirement to learn a language so I, I learned German in school I studied German uh, in school and then university because I understood from very early on that I needed to be doing more so even before I'd even enter the workforce I had that narrative from school that you know this is a nuanced space they're going to there's more that's going to be expected from me because of my background because of my culture this is what it's going to be like so you know you doing work you know in a private practice law firm and you're doing crazy hours you're doing the languages you're doing all the additionals and you're still not necessarily getting the recognition that you deserve even though you are going um, at least on paper above and beyond and I think that can be challenging because when you don't see the fruit when you are doing more and you're doing you know maybe not sleeping very well you know you're not you're having a social life you're not really getting to have your evenings over a long period of time and you don't see the evidence you will make changes because you'll say, well, if this is not getting me to where I need to go, why am I doing all of this work, right? You tend to, almost like an, as a natural, to, there's a level of, there is a level of defeatist, but there's also a level of self-care where you get to a point you're like, well, I need to take care of myself. And if that means stepping back and not doing as much, I will do that because doing the most or doing more hasn't actually gotten me anywhere. And actually even existing in that space, a lot of our parents, mothers and fathers would have had a similar experience, um, especially if they're coming to Europe um, where they've done that. And even if it's been recognized, they've had to stay in that space and never really gotten the respite they deserve. So I think for many of us having witnessed that, um, we are not desirous of the same thing happening to us. We're saying, well, hey, I'm this age or that age, I don't want to be at the end of my career burnt out and tired without the, the, I would say the accolades or the, as one would say, the receipts to show the, the what I've put in. So I think, again, um, there is a narrative, especially in this community, that it is not work that pays off. And actually, I think for many people during lockdown, it became a key opportunity to really reflect on that and say, when I go back into the workforce, having been in this space of having a bit more rest and balance, you know, do I want to continue that when I go back into the workforce, you know, and really having people just being like, actually, no. So I think it's a fair, a fair point to, to, to consider. Um, Victoire, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And I just wanted to add a few things to what you, 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 you were just uh, saying. I think, you know, the, the, the mindset of working hard is something that has been, you know, we we raised with that, right? I, I think at least from my from my parents, I always got that advice: you need to work hard, you need to go work hard, you need to be best in class, best in anything you're doing. So, um, this is something I was raised with, and and I never 
um, you know, I, I never, you know, I, I, I never tried to do anything less than just working hard. But, uh, you know, while gaining experience, while, you know, um, working within different work environments, I've noticed that it's not about working hard. It's really about working smart. Um, and, 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 we, and there are ways to work smart. So working hard is good, but we should think about, you know, how to do, to do the mix. And, and to be able to do the mix, we need to find out is the working environment I am in healthy? We need to look for, for a company that, you know, that provides a healthy working environment. And it's also important for the company to provide kind of recognition, right? Because I think we all, um, we all need that to be able to, you know, to, to work beyond our normal working hours, to be motivated and to do above, you know, above uh, the average. That's what I wanted to add. Thank you. So key. And we'll definitely uh, delve more into that you know, as we go on. So you know, it's a very key point and recognition is one of the key aspects that we look for, right? When you're working that hard, you want to see people um, responding to that, respecting that as well. Um, I just wanted to quickly ask um, Jessica, I mean, a, a big part of that is understanding our journeys, right? In, in this workforce, you know, how we've, how we've progressed. Um, all of us now are kind of in fairly senior positions. Um, I just wanted to ask you very briefly um, what your journey has been like. If you can kind of summarize some of you know your experience in terms of getting to the point now where you're a director. Um, but overall, my career, it, uh, I started my career working for an organization and uh, I went in and I was very loud about I'm going to be here a couple of years and then I'm going to move on because I realized this place is a stepping stone. And actually I stayed there for a lot longer because I was promoted quite a few times. Uh, I felt I feel like I've I've worked in organizations that have been balanced and have embraced my me and my culture. Um, and I have been able to show them what I can do uh, as I've moved throughout from one industry to another, as I've moved throughout my career. So I think. I've been, I started out with having a mentor who really pushed me when I was young. Uh, and I feel like as I've moved through my career, I moved into management. I've tried to make sure I do the same for other people um, and coming to Fitch and moving up to the role and being a director at Fitch um, has allowed me not only to use my experience, but also to reach out to other people that look like me and try and help them and mentor them as well. Thank you so much. That's really, really good. And I think what I like is that opportunity to kind of pass the, the, the baton, if that makes sense, to kind of say, you know, I actually um, probably needed that or have had that, um, you know, and then passing it on to someone else who also needs that support. So, so thank you. Um, just going to go on to our um, next uh, quote. So employees today are looking for a holistic work experience that meets their physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional needs. I, I would strongly agree with that. I think that's very, um, I would say, uh, poignant because actually prior to this, that wasn't a thing. You know, having a healthy working environment, having a balanced work was not a thing at all. You worked hard and you pushed and you got to the top and it was those who uh, were doing the most that were considered to be the best, right? So I think, again, we've had an opportunity through the pandemic and just maybe um, over the couple, last couple of years to reflect on what that looks like. Um, so we're just gonna get the second poll up um, and we're gonna ask this next question. Um, just before we get that up, does work need to meet all of your physical, mental, spiritual and emotional needs? So get the, get the next uh, poll up, that would be great. Yes, we're getting the next poll up. Just give us a second. Sure. While we do that, I just want to read a comment from Mary A. Working smart and also indexing for your self-care and health in, a modern, in modern work is a learned skill. It is important that people, Black people especially, share their work experiences because the essentials of career navigation and smart work may not be available to other black people. I think that's really, really key. 
Um, and I'm a big advocate of mentorship because actually I think you learn from others who are aware of, of what's possible. Um, so again, you know, it's so key to learn from others and their experiences to really understand um, about working smart. So thank you, Mary. Okay, so I think we're having some tech issues in launching the poll. Um, I will see if I can do it from my side. Just give me a second. I think I can do it actually, let me launch it. Okay, great. Okay, so can everyone see that? So does work need to meet all of your physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional needs? Select all that apply. Nice. So we've got a lot for mental. So we've got a comment from Eden. No, it shouldn't because work should work shouldn't encompass all of your life. Life should be an aspect of your life that helps you look after those holistic elements. Um, Debem says, it's a personal choice. I believe make work work for you. It has to enhance my life and otherwise and get enjoyment from it otherwise. I'm not going to be fully alive and look forward to being there. When I can see it's more than just the money that I get from this, it's a more enjoyable living experience. Thank you, it's a great comment there. Yeah. Okay. Just got a few more to go. Lauren says, that's a very good question. I feel like work doesn't need to cover all the needs, but should not detract from them. I agree with that. Yeah. Got a lot of agreements with, uh, with that. So it's good. Okay. Just going to read some of the results now. So we've got a lot of a lot of points for um, mental. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to share these results. So we've got quite a few for mental, some for emotional, uh, spiritual, also physical. So top seems to be mental and emotional. Um, does everyone agree with that on the panel? Do you think that those are the key things that you? think matter for you or would you disagree with the results anyone can go I think some of it comes from uh culture in a work place and uh if I look at the places I've been happiest in it's been a place where I have colleagues that I get along with that I have uh, you know, an environment in which is comfortable, uh, you know, you can be yourself without um, having to, you know, lessen yourself. So I think being able to foster a culture, have a group of people around you that you see sometimes more than you see your own family and friends, it does mean that some of those things, even though you don't realise it, like the emotional and so on, it comes from just those people and the interactions you have with them. But ultimately, my life outside of work before I came to work you know all of that is is the things that are key to me if I look at what's important in my life work is important it, it achieves the goals that I want to but if I had to give up my family or my friends or the things that I love or give up work work would be the one that I would choose first so I think it, it enables me to do things that I want to, but it also in that allows me to use my brain to feel fulfilled in other ways, which I wouldn't necessarily get from just going around my daily business without work. So. No, it's a great point. And, you know, again, you spend so much time here, as you said, so it has to be a, a balance in terms of what it provides. Um, Manuel, what, what do you think? No, I completely agree. And I also agree with um, Lauren's point where she says that it doesn't need to cover all your needs, but it shouldn't subtract from the other areas. Um, and that being said as well, I think em emotionally, yes, because you deal with people every single day, but I wouldn't 
go to work expecting work to cover my spiritual my physical needs I think um I would do that somewhere else but I I would want to make sure that work doesn't subtract from my emotional from my physical need so that I can give the best version of myself at work um and that's why for me personally I think it's important to separate work and other aspects of your life and for me that that works well for me because when I can focus on other areas of my life I turn up as the best Emmanuel and I can be super productive um so yeah I agree with what um Jessica and and Lauren said as well thank you and finally Victoire do you what do you have anything different or do you feel it's the same for you no, it's totally the same for me. So I definitely agree with Emmanuel. Work has to be a kind of counterbalance to, to you know, to other aspects of my life. So I, I totally agree. Thank you. I'm just going to quickly read a comment uh, from one of the, the members of, of the audience. Having a supportive manager and team can either make or break your employee experience and affect or impact you in all of these areas. I think that is very, very true. I think that as with anything, environment plays a massive part in how you feel at work. And even if you're going there to get, you know, physical, just, just you know, get paid or um, get experience, you know, you can be impacted emotionally if it's negative or positive, right? So that's a, that's a key fact that we don't always uh, think about. So thank you for that. Would you say, and this, and this is a uh, again uh, for Victoire, would you say that there are different, um, the different generations have different expectations of work? So in terms of like a Gen Z environment or, or generation versus maybe an older generation, would you say that there are different expectations and is it achievable to, you know, maybe change how you feel or expectations at work as well? Yes, definitely. Um... <laughs> because I, I just think that, you know, it's been 13 years now that I'm, you know, that I'm in the corporate world and or maybe even 15 years now. And, um, you know, I've seen quite a lot of uh, uh, changes within, you know, within within the corporate world. And, and, and it's also due to, you know, to I mean, we had um, COVID-19, which kind of um, uh, shaped everything else in terms of uh, working culture, um, and I think from our, if I may say so, right, from our generation, um, we we had a different understanding of working, which was working hard, which was going every day to work, which was having a job for of at least nine to six. That was the minimum, even you know, if not uh, longer, um, and we didn't really put a lot of emphasis on you know on that holistic wellness or holistic you know working place and so on and so forth it was really about uh going to work um you know having my salary at the end of the month because that was what you know what really counted and nowadays and and again with this you know let's say you know with what with everything that happened with covid or after covid um i think the younger generation just just look differently even in terms of you know when they are looking for a job right so they 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 they, they you know they, they, they put some emphasis on different aspects of life or different aspects of work which are you know some people talk about work-life balance but some other people talk about life balance um so that, that's that's definitely different right and 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 to be honest today i'll i'll probably also have a rather um you know look after that yeah, why why not, you know, kind of give some importance to the view of that younger generation because yeah, I mean life is so fast. We are working in such we are living in such a fast world that it's sometimes it's really important to kind of just take it easy, um, you know, just lay back a little bit and think about things that are, you know, upcoming. So it's not just about, you know, running through, you know, to through some I don't know some 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 topics or some goals we've set ourselves. We want a big house, or we want to you know go on vacation or whatsoever, and just working to reach those goals. But also to take some time to to reflect on you know on our life and on you know on emotions and 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 spirituality and whatsoever. So yeah, I think the views have changed definitely. 
Thank you, great answer. And I would say just in terms of the um, quote we've got, you know, the definition we've got on, on screen, you know, what is the holistic approach to employees? Holistic wellness takes it a step further by considering multiple dimensions of employee well-being. This approach to wellness recognizes that employees are influenced by many factors, including their physical health, emotions, social relationships, and financial circumstances. And I would say that is very, very accurate. Um, I actually have, I would say, quite a, a funny perspective from the team I, I worked with recently. So I, I hired a number of, I would say, Gen Z uh, uh, employees recently in my team. And their approach to how they looked at work for me was very enlightening. And I, I would say I'm not that much older than them, but the difference in how we, we took um, the day-to-day, -day, you know, the, the need for breaks, the need for space, the need for, um, you know, flexibility was, was very present from the beginning. You know, they're very much able to kind of say from the start, I need this level of flexibility. I'm not going to be doing this round the clock, you know, and we're very clear on what the boundaries were. And I think that's a big thing in terms of having those boundaries to know what is it I need to do to achieve my job versus, you know, overworking yourself, thinking that that will also guarantee you success. So I think I've learned a lot from, from that generation in terms of um, how I approach my life as well. And I think, you know, when it comes to work, um, the perspective for me has shifted completely because actually I think um, a big part of it, and I will say this and actually going to uh, the next uh, section is, knowing you are capable and understanding that you deserve to be in the room. And I think when you start from that perspective of, I deserve to be here, um, you know, my qualifications and my presence to an extent is enough. And you work from that space of kind of awareness, self-awareness, um, it's very different your experience because you understand what you're coming to do and, and what you want to you know, expect in return from uh, your workforce. So um, again, you know, I think the expectations have changed in terms of uh, what we, look for and I think for employers in the room it's good to really um, be aware of that and actually understand okay what am I offering my staff you know what makes them want to come back to work you know am I giving them balance am I giving them flexibility opportunities to learn and grow and be recognized in exchange for their their hard work so uh, again you know really good points there um just continuing on the Gen Z topic. So this is a big one because obviously we're learning a lot as well. Um, would you say that your tactics or your strategy for personal development has changed? Um, and what are your tactics for success? Um, Emmanuel, um, it would be great to ask you that. What is your strategy for personal development and what are your tactics for success? Um, I just missed the Gen Z generation. I'm a millennial, but just missed. So I feel that I'm, I can relate to them so much. Um, one thing that I really take from the Gen Z is that I've actually quite adopted in my work, my work development is Gen Z have a different approach. They really value making an impact on the world. So they won't, I think the Gen Xers I mean, don't quote me on it, but um, they are more concerned about, you know, right, I, I need to look after my family. I have to pay the bills. I need to pay the mortgage. Gen Zs, they want to make an impact on work. So in fact, they won't even take on the job if they feel that they won't have an impact in the role. And I, I quite like that. I think it's important. I think you need to have a sense of fulfillment at work because like we mentioned, or, or Jessica mentioned before is we spend so much time at work um our colleagues are the people we probably see the most so I think it's important to 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 also love what you do and to enjoy what you do as well um so that's the tactic I've taken is going for roles staying in a role that I really enjoy that I see my impact um that I want to progress in and and that I feel a part of and I feel in, inclusivity um, in so yeah that's my tactic. Thank you it's so key to, to really understand that I think it's it's actually really um, such a I think sometimes it's difficult for us to step back a little bit and say you know is this fulfilling the things that I'm looking for, you know, in this in this space, you know, what is it that I'm actually trying to to get out of this? You know, does it 
does it give me that on a day-to-day -day basis? So um, I actually had a question for the audience generally, and please feel free to type it in the chat, but do you, if you're a Gen Z uh, of that generation, uh, would you agree with this? Is What's your approach to work? Um, we've got a few people, I would say, from a, a bit of a, a generation before who say, um, Right, because work is an exchange of you as a resource as it to an organization. The mistake I made was valuing the organization and work, work, work over myself. You need to have a foundation and sense of self and nurture that first before you can even deliver in a work situation. Very key, Mary, thank you for that. Um, Fiona, everything flows from all of these areas and personal understanding of boundaries and making sure these boundaries are respected can be difficult, especially in the pandemic. I grew up in a culture where that wasn't uh, the culture and you don't rock the boat uh, working hard making the shift to understand that personal limitations are needed for mental health and greater productivity can be difficult for others who are set in old ways and values very very key um, from Sonia we've got I think previously especially for people of color working twice as hard to get half also meant expecting less and asking for less that mindset is hard to change especially where it has led to successes the compromise that millennials and boomers have, have made have allowed Gen Zs to feel safe enough in the environment to demand more from their work. I really like that. I think we have to also give credence to um, the, our generation and generation before who effectively set the foundation for this kind of successful path. Um, as you said, you know, you've gotten to a point where hopefully the next generation feels more comfortable to, to be in a position to ask for more and to be better positioned to be able to kind of get what they need from work. So again, you know, really, really um, key. So we've got some um, thumbs up to, to, to these uh, points regarding previously what we've expected. Um, Eden says, yes, I have a boomer manager and I think they have struggled with the shift of shifting their work expectations. I enjoy having my lunch by myself to recoup. They don't seem to understand that. I, that, that's me <laughs> as well. I hide very often to have my lunch and it is hard for people to sometimes understand, you know, uh, just the need for space and the need for, for peace in, in an environment that's very busy. Um, I think also, you know, asking for, again, boundaries with regards to what you do is not expected. You're supposed to be available, especially in the legal field, those will know, you know, you're on, you are on all the time, you're on call, you, you don't have, you know, weekends are not yours. You know, so again, that need for space and boundaries is a very new concept for many of us. So definitely well understood. Um, Lauren says, sadly, as a Gen Z, I've not yet found a workplace I feel safe in. Yet, however, this statement is very true, as I think I have been able to quit a toxic environment whilst my predecessors have had to often endure them. Very, very, very key. Um, and you know what? I think the big thing is really the fact that you have, you feel that you have the option or the, the, the right to quit that environment and find something better. I think that mentality alone is such an improvement to what people would enjoy and put up with in the past. So um, Eden says, I went as far as getting a work phone so she would only contact me during work hours. I'm also here with that as well. So I think many of us are doing that. I do not put my work, my, my personal phone number on anything. Um, and even my work phone, more often than not, is on silent because I'm like, well, you know, who might call me at 8, 9 p.m.? You know, boundaries again. Um, Jordan says, I read a recent article that stress that stresses working from home permanently may not be good for mental health. I think the novelty of, of working from home has worn off since the pandemic. Uh, thanks, Jordan. I mean, I would say I have heard many stories that some people find themselves working even more at home. So, you know, they don't, they haven't learned those boundaries. So actually working from home exacerbates the fact that they're being overstretched and people say, well, you're at home already. I can email you well into the night and have your attention because you're already at home. So again, you know, it has to be vocalized what your boundaries are. Otherwise home or office, it's still gonna be the same, right? So that's really, really useful. Um, so we're just gonna um, go into the Q&A. Um, we did have a few hands up. Feel free to, to raise your hand if you have a question for our panelists or drop a question in the chat. Um, we've got some, some more comments. Question from Deben. What would you love to see in the future of a workplace on wellbeing and development? Uh, I'm going to ask Jessica. 
what would you want to see in the future of that? Uh, equality. <laughs> as, a, as a black woman, uh, I would like to be able to come into the room and have an equal footing from the get-go and across all of the subjects we've talked about today, um, I think that would would be a very good start. I think there's a long way to go after that, but if we could just start out from an equal um, footing, then that would be my ideal. And I, um, I, I've worked for organizations, as I said, that really do well, but I still think there's a lot of um, work to be done across various countries. So, equality. <laughs> Thank you, really good point. Victoire, what would you like to see? Um, I think, you know, to be able to have a healthy work environment, you need to think of what is it you can bring in. And I think we of the uh, minority, we should think of maybe working closer together, you know, whenever we start in the company and, and uh, realize that there are some others, uh, some other minorities, we should maybe, um, yeah, kind of build up a, a, a lobby, a community to kind of enrich each other and to kind of support each other. And that's something that could be of, of great help. And, and, and I know what I'm talking about. And, and <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's, that's really important. That's key. That's key to self-development. That's key to uh, help the company also uh, understand that we have our, you know, we have our struggles and, and we have some, you know, some, some, some things we want, we want, you know, we want to change within the company and we need to have or to make our voice heard. And that's important, being able to make, to make your voice heard. I, I agree. And I actually have a comment here that says, what's the rule of thumb around self-advocacy for people of color, especially blacks? I've heard, I've read several articles saying it's frowned upon when black women, men self-advocate and it's better to have a stakeholder advocate on their behalf. Um, what are your views and experiences? And I, I think we'll definitely come to that in terms, because I know we've spoken a lot about that and you know between ourselves we can definitely talk about the importance of, of that so thank you um we've got a couple of comments here equality of pay the fact that there is an even an ethnic an ethnic pay gap is, a, is appalling um equity over equality i agree with that um and i think people tend to miss the distinction between equity and equality you know equality is you know everybody having the same thing Equity is making sure that there are the relevant measures in place for those who are less privileged or less advantaged to ensure that they can get to that point. And I think a lot of people miss that um, and do not recognize the disadvantages or the disparities in the first place to ensure that everybody's getting a fair chance and getting enough visibility. Um, I, I'll give a, a, a not so fun example, but you know, uh, in previous times, I won't say which company, um, finding leaders of color was a big thing. So finding an advocate for yourself who understands what you're going through to, to be your sponsor, to be able to kind of um, advise on how to navigate the environment is, is difficult, right? Because if you don't have people who are ahead of you, who look like you, you know, where do you go? I mean, you can get uh, other, um, let's say mentors and sponsors of other races, but there is a unique advantage having someone who understands your lived experience. So for many people, the lack of that means there isn't the equity in having the same level of sponsorship or advocacy, right? So it does make a big difference. Um, for me, I would say trust. Trust is one that I think adds to the value of having the flexibility and having the freedom. If you have trust from your leaders or your managers, that makes a big difference in terms of what you feel comfortable uh, asking for, right? If you have distrust despite your efforts or you don't have the level of if they're micromanaging you, for example, even if you're doing the best you can, you don't have the ability to say, actually, could I finish at five today? It's very reasonable because you're expected to do more to, to, to build that trust, right? So um, again, that's quite a key point. Um, got a, a comment here. Victoire just touched on a good point. Black professionals, especially uh, women, should really help each other more in the corporate world. I'm from the States and know 
culture plays a role and as the British culture is more reserved, what do you suggest or how does one go about finding and maintaining community in the corporate space? Um, very, very, very uh, key points raised there. Um, and I will definitely <laughs> let the audience take that. Um, Emmanuel, uh, what would you say to that? How would you go about finding and maintaining community within the corporate space? I think that's a good question. And if I'm completely honest, it's a question that I'm still also navigating. Um, but I would say um, it's always easier going to somebody that looks like you. <laughs> Um, there's that nav uh, sorry that natural gravitation towards somebody that looks like you. Um, I would say finding people that you trust, finding groups such as Embrace, um, diversity groups, people that have gone through the same things as you and that you can have honest conversations with. Um, yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's really fantastic. And, and I would say, you know, previously with Embrace, when I joined, Fitch, the key thing for me was community for myself. You know, I think a big part of wanting to start something up like that was, you know, not seeing or having the experience of having a career where I saw people that looked like myself. I actually thought when I came to Fitch that they'd hired me by mistake, not that I didn't deserve the job, but because there was somebody who looked like me on the team already. So like, you know, there's two of us, you guys do know that there's two of us here. So, cause I wasn't used to, you know, there was always concern about different things. So I think this is something that I feel um, you know, it's, it's a silly, silly thing about it now, but actually it was something that was the first thing that I noticed was that, you know, you know, there's two of us, what, what does that mean? Um, and I think we, un we misunderstand or um, don't value enough the, the importance of community. Even if they're not senior to you, having someone who can share your experiences and can support you in what you're going through, who you can talk to about what's going on. Um, these are key aspects. Again, having a, a network is so important because again, it means you have people who can really just relate with what you're experiencing. Um, and again, maybe advocate for you. Um, a comment earlier was about sponsorship and advocacy. And I think that is so, so powerful. Um, I'm, I've been fortunate to have um, uh, more uh, people around me who are willing to support me and sponsor me and mentor me and that has made a massive difference in my um, journey you know over the last couple of years it's literally transformed what I've been able to do the opportunities that have been afforded to me so it's a big part of that um, you know Jessica mentioned again mentoring others I'm myself wanting to look for mentees because I understand the value that I've had from it so again you know the, the even the inspiration of the fact that it's made me want to stay where I am um, and look for other people I can help, again, is a shift from wanting to quite quit or, or loud quit because actually you've got the support system you need that gives you that more holistic experience. Um, I just wanna quickly go through some of these takeaways. You know, We've had a lot of points raised today and I think we need to really understand maybe some of the um, alternatives to quite quitting. You know, Come as a group, you know, find a network, it's easy to learn. Uh, use your ERGs, your employer resource groups to really uh, get advice, get support. Um, network across the company, you know, look for uh, other representatives. And, and also, even if it's um, someone that doesn't necessarily look like you, you know, try to find connection, um, ask for mentors. And I think uh, this is where, you know, even with asking leadership at Fitch, I would say we're good at, we're better at this, much better at this is, you know, uh, whatever background you're from, you know, black, white, Asian, people have come forward to uh, be ment mentors. Uh, we've got one on, on the call, Mike Simonton. Thank you so much for joining, um, who's been a great uh, mentor to many of us and a great sponsor and advocate for many of us at Fitch. So again, you know, there are people who are willing, you know, if you ask, who have put themselves forward and, and taken the time. Um, create a clear goal plan for yourself. You know, what, what is it you're looking for? What do you want to, to, to see in your workplace? What do you want to see for your career experience? Uh, coaching, some of us you know, have had the opportunity to be coached within the business or externally. You know, these are great opportunities to really learn more um, or research you know, if you can. Uh, BYP offer great uh, mentoring programs, coaching, you know, talk to them. Um, sometimes step back and listen to your goals. Are your goals reasonable? Are they uh, manageable do, do they make sense in your environment do you need to look for uh you know guidance as to changing or, or altering what the goals you have uh, are 
Um, and again, finally, give yourself space. Um, balance is so key. Having rest, respite and, and boundaries is so important to ensure that work isn't just the only thing you have going for you. Uh, it's very important to have uh, that opportunity to really balance uh, what you're doing and, and really consider it. Um, I've got a last comment about this. Um, I read the book, Stealing the Corner Office, which goes into more detail about documenting your achievements. Uh, and I think also doing the networking. So a great uh, recommendation there. Thank you, Mary, on, on the books and um, what you're doing in terms of documenting your journey. We've got a couple of minutes to close. Um, so I'm going to just hand back over to, to BYP. Um, I personally want to thank you all for joining and also to our panelists for um, engaging in this great conversation. So, so thank you. And I'm just going to hand over to BYP to, to close us out.